Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us on the day. I'm excited once again that you're here to celebrate and to hear what God has to say uh, according to his word. It's an opportunity for us to worship him in spirit and truth. It is amazing that we are on the eve of celebrating uh, uh, that drum major uh, of justice called uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and we're grateful for his service, his legacy, his love of people, and his instrument uh, of being able to change the landscape and the breath of this entire world. So once again, I'm thankful that you're here. So let us go to God in a moment of prayer and supplication and intercession. Let us pray. God, our Father, we just thank you for this day, Master. Most of all, I thank you for your darling son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege and the honor to come before your people and those who are viewing online. Pray, oh God, that they're safe, that they're healthy, that they're in a good place at this moment in time. But now, God, we're praying that you will give us preaching clarity and conciseness and focus of the text so that this word will be relevant and applicable to the lives that are viewing online or those who may be listening by some other form of technology. It's in your daughter, son, Jesus the Christ, name. we do pray. Amen. Once again, I'm excited that God has blessed us to be here at this moment in time to celebrate him and to honor him on this day. Again, the eve of Dr. Martin Luther King's celebration uh, which we celebrate uh, on tomorrow, even though his birthday is on January the 15th, we celebrate him. And we're grateful, brothers and sisters, uh, that you are here to share in the word of God. But on today, I want to encourage you to go with me for a word I believe that is applicable and that will change your life literally in so many different ways. So if you have your Bibles, turn with us to the historical book of 1 Samuel, and that's 1 Samuel chapter number 17. I'm going to look at verses 4 through 9. This is a narrative uh, that many of you should be familiar with um, in your reading, in your consumption of the Word of God. So go with me, 1 Samuel chapter 17, and let's look at verse number 4, if you will. And verse number 4 says, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Verse number five, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. Verse number six, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. Verse number seven, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed six, 600 shekels of iron. One bearing a shield went before him. Verse number eight. And he stood and cried out unto the army of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come to set your battle array? Am I not a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? He says, Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. Verse number nine. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. First Samuel chapter 17, verses, uh, verses uh, 4 through 9, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. I want to encourage you to hang your hat around that image and around that depiction of this mammoth of a man named Goliath. In better translation, better translation, he's approximately nine foot six inches tall, uh, weighing a, a, a massive amount of weight with all the regalia and all of the armory and the tools at his disposal, prepared to wreak havoc on the children of Israel or on the army of Israel. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I want to encourage you to think about uh, on that day, January the 6th, 2021. A protest, what has been deemed as a protest, but we've come to find out later, it was much more than a protest. This massive mob, this mammoth crowd, this large group of individuals came to the streets of Washington, D.C., to hear the incumbent president and he's, as he espoused his thoughts, his politics, and his vitriolic nature. 
And as they listened there with great anticipation and expectation, it's as though they were given marching orders to go uh, to plummet the House of Representatives as well as the Senate. And this crowd has been uh, inspired and influenced and they are, they are upset, they're mad, they're angry. But I want to encourage you to understand that it was a massive mob. And in the description of one of the Metropolitan Police, he said as though that this crowd came toward them. It felt like it was more than 15,000 individuals with only about 30 police officers prepared to protect the House and the Senate. And he said in his description, which is, which is breathtaking, it's mind-boggling, the mammoth movement, the mob, this massive mob that came there. And he describes it, and just my takeaway from his conversation and his description, I believe that that mob was not only a crushing mob, not only an overwhelming mob, a mob that came to bring hurt and devastation a massive mob prepared to destroy whatever was in its way. Brothers and sisters, sisters, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps you and I have passed, faced some large, mammoth, overwhelming, crushing, devastating, and despairing obstacles, struggles, or giants in our lives. But I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, those giants, ladies and gentlemen, can come into form in so many different forms. Giants like worry. Giants like doubt. Giants like anxiety. Giants like depression. Giants like massive financial uh, devastation. Health issues. Whatever it is, it is massive, it is moving, and it's designed to create mass destruction in your life. And those giants, brothers and sisters, may seem to be overwhelming, may seem to be crushing, may seem as though that they are prepared to literally take your life completely apart. But brothers and sisters, you're not the only person that has been in that place and space. Here we have the children of Israel preparing themselves, and they are debating, discussing, dialoguing as to who would have the ability to face these gi this giant, this mammoth of a man who's espousing threat, trouble, and trauma on the people of God. And so the question of our is, what must one do when you are, when the giant shows up? How do you face these giants? Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a new year, but it does not mean that this year will not be uh, uh, void or not filled with giants. But I don't want you to fret. I don't want you to fear. I don't want you to be frightened. I don't want you to become frail or frustrated. But I do believe that God has a plan for you and I on how to face these giants when the giants show up. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, let me get quickly into the text. I want to encourage you uh, to look at this very closely as we see the exhibition and the demonstration of God's power at this moment. Even when we feel as though we are very small, insignificant, and minute against the massiveness of life that's trying to crush us and trying to take us out. I want to encourage you to tell you that the devil is alive. That giants do fall. So listen as we go through this narrative momentarily. I want us to pick up, we've already gotten a description of this massive man that's preparing, that's espousing, that's threatening them, that's causing trauma and trouble for the people of God. And now they are pontificating. They, are, they have a paralysis of analysis trying to figure out who, what, when, and where will be able to face this giant. Are they without? Are they overwhelmed? 
Are they at the last or the end of their lives? When giants show up. So what are the biblical keys, clues, methodology, and pathway for addressing these giants? I want to jump right into this, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. We've gotten that description of this giant of a man who's approximately nine feet, uh, nine feet tall, six inches, standing across the ravine, and this Philistine is ready to do battle, to ready to do war, to bring bro bring brokenness and and burdens upon the life of the children of Israel. They are perplexed. They are with their backs up against the wall. What must one do when you are when you are facing the giants and when the giants show up unexpectedly? Listen, as you will. The story goes on. Let me see if I can contemporize it. The story goes on when the question comes in as to who will deal with this giant. As we pick up in verse 12, it says, Now David was the son of Ephraim and Bethlehem Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. The man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul, verse number 13. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went out and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of these three sons that went to the battle with Eli, firstborn, and Abaddon, and Shammah. And here are the three sons. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. Saul was frightened. He was overwhelmed. He was looking and scourging, trying to find somebody that could represent the children of God and stand before this mammoth of a man, this mobster, this huge obstacle, this, this huge barrier between the children of God and victory. And there stood there prepared, positioned, and poised to take out the children of Israel. So the question is, what must they do at this moment? So I'm so glad you asked. As we take a look at this, I want to jump into this real quickly. Because now uh, Saul has gone to retrieve those sons to bring them to battle and try to decide who can be prepared to face this giant. And here they are, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, it's imperative for us to understand. The first thing I want to suggest to you is that as we get through this narrative between verses 12 and following, we will notice that they are they are they they are back and forth, back and forth. And David, who is the youngest of the sons, is responsible for carrying food to the front lines. But he's not engaged in the battle at this moment. He's not prepared for the battle at this moment. But they are looking and searching who will face this giant. None of the eldest sons of Jesse were prepared, positioned. And, 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 and in a good place to face this giant. But Saul was searching for somebody to stand against this giant. So we want to pick up in verse number uh, 20 and following. It says, And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and, and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, an army against the army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, verse 22. And as he talked with them, and behold, there came up unto the champion, the Philistine, the Go Go Goliath, spake according to the same words. And David heard him. David overheard him, threatening him, causing trauma, and trying to traumatize the people of the living God. And nobody was prepared to face this giant. It's as though they have stuck their head in the sand and Saul is wondering who will come and face this giant. So I want to suggest to you, dear brothers and sisters, that there's, a, there's some pearls of wisdom that's right here in the text that will help us to navigate and face the giants. The first thing I want to suggest to you is look at verses 28 through 22 and we'll pick it up. The first thing that you and I must do when giants do show up, when giants show up, is to filter in the battle. What do you mean? Look at verses 28 and following. Notice what it says here clearly. It says, And uh, Eli, the eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eli's anger was kindled against David, because David says, If you need somebody, I'm prepared. 
If you want somebody, I'm prepared. I'm not afraid. I'm not frightened. I'm prepared to go against the people, that this man that's trying to destroy God's people. But immediately, verse number 28, we pick up. His brother begins to speak and says, Why comest thou down here? And with whom has thou left that who is facing, who is helping to deal with the sheep back at home in the wilderness? Why are you here? He says, I know thy pride and thy haughtiness or naughtiness of thine heart, but thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Verse number 29, David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? You need somebody to face this giant. You need somebody to battle this. So the first thing I want to suggest to you is that when David asked that question between verses 28, 28 through 32, he filters in the battle. The first person that he filters is, it, it, the, he reasoned with the other voices. Then David says, is there not a cause? Listen to verse 29, if you will. He says, uh, is there not a cause? Verse 30, he says, and he turned from him and toward another and spake again in the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard, which David spake, they rehearsed him before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fall because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. So the first thing that David does, he has to learn to filter in the battle. When he's facing this giant, he begins to reason with other voices and says, is there not a cause? And secondly, David says, I refuse to be a victim because I operate from a place of victory. He says, I'm not a victim, I'm a victor. God has given me the victory. So he began to reason with the other voices. He began to understand he needed to refuse to be a victim. And he, re he released himself to volunteer. And see, that's what the giants don't want you to do. They don't want you to reason with other voices. They don't want you to refuse to be a victim. As long as you're stuck and stale in that place and the giants can overwhelm you, overcome you, then you will remain paralyzed in the midst of your predicament. But you got to learn how to filter out those voices, filter out those situations and those circumstances and allow it to go through one ear and out the other. Those people will say, that's too much for you to handle. That's too large. You don't have this and you don't have this. You're insignificant. You don't have much value. You don't have much substance. Who are you to face somebody such so mammoth as that? But brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, it's important and imperative for us to know that he learned how to filter in the battle. And since we're on the eve of Dr. Martin Luther King, don't you know that King was able to get to that I have a dream speech because he learned how to filter in the battle. He didn't listen to everything that was being said, his critics, his criticism, his spectators, and his haters, but he learned how to filter it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I want to encourage you to put on the filters because when the giants come, people, places, and predicaments will say that it's impossible. But not, number one, not only learn how to filter in the battle, but number two, we must be prepared to fight in the battle. Listen to what happens in verse number 33. It says here, and Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, but but he be a, he's a man of war. But notice what he says in verse number 32. He says, he says, I'm willing to fight. <laughs> so we have to learn how to fight in the battle. But understand this, learning how to fight in the battle, that sometimes you will be ridiculed, will become your experience because he says to him, you are nothing more than a youth. You don't have the ability, you don't have the capability, you don't have the wherewithal, and that's what Satan wants to say to you and I. When the giants come, they will crush us with fear and doubt and anxiety and say, you don't have what it takes. But David, he says, I must fight in this battle. I'm not going to lay down. I'm not going to roll over. And that's what I want to suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen. Don't lay down and roll over. But, but understand this. Understand that ridicule will come. 
they made fun of Jesus. They laughed at so many different people. Down through the years. Think about moments in time. Those who have laughed at Dr. Martin Luther King. Those who laughed at Harriet Tubman. Those who laughed at Ida B. Wells. Those who laughed at Barack Obama. Said that it's not possible. But they learned how to fight in about battle. And notice here, he, he not only understood that I will not be ridiculed. That's David. But secondly, notice what happens. Listen, as we continue to read. Pick up in verse number 34. He says, and David said unto him, thy servant kept his father's sheep. Notice him putting out his resume, his biographical sketch, his history, his, his curriculum vitae, if you will. His history, his profile. Notice what David says. He says, I kept my father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and tried to take the lamb out of the flock and I went out after him because I am a fighter. I know how to fight in the battle. I will not lay down. He says, 35, he says, I went after him and smote him and delivered him out of the mouth and when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and I smote him and slew him. The servant slew both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine. He says, David says, I am not going to be ridiculed and I want to report my experience. I've had other giants. I've had other battles. I have all other overwhelming situations and I want you to know my history. I want you to know my story of how God got me through and how God got me over. And this is just one battle that will be in the line of the rest, rest of the battles that I've already fought. David says, I've learned how to filter in the battle. But David says, I have learned how to fight in the battle. But David says, he says here, listen to verse number 37. Verse number 37, David said, more with the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with you. David says, he says, I'm going to report to you my experience. But secondly, I want you to understand that I shall not be ridiculed. But thirdly, he says, I want to show you my resource. Because if God be for me, who can be against me? If, if, if God says in the word, no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? And whom shall I be fearful of? So no giant, whether it's the giant of worry, the giant of broken relationship, the giant of despair, the giant of depression, the giant of isolation and being ostracized or quarantined, it shall not win. He says, because I'm going to show you my resource. Because God plus one always equals a majority. And as long as God be for me, who can be against me? Because nothing can separate me from the love of God. When the giants show up, you and I must filter in the battle. And we must be determined to fight in the battle. But not only that, when giants show up, we must face up in the battle. Listen, if you will, to verses 45 and following after this conversation, this dialogue continues back and forth. Verse number 45, it says, let's pick up at verse number 44. It says, and the Philistines said to David, come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. He talked the whole lot of stuff. And that's what giants of life will do. It will constantly talk to you, talk at you, and talk about you, and try to convince you that you are less than, that you're incapable of, that you don't have the ability, that you don't have the X factor, and the devil is alive. Not only must we filter in the battle, not only must we fight in the battle, but we must face up in the battle. The giant is going to try to overwhelm you and succumb you and drag you in and convince you that you don't have the ability to handle 
this giant that's before you. But listen, listen to verse 45 and following. He says, then David said to, then said David to the Philistine, thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But notice David, here, here is, here is the X factor. Here is the weapon of mass destruction. David says, but I come to thee, here it is, in the name of of the Lord, <laughs> Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. Jehovah Sitkanu, God, the great one who's able to do exceedingly abundantly all that we can ever ask, think, or drink. David says, I don't come to you by myself. It may appear as though I'm by myself. It may appear as though that I'm not going to get the victory, that I'm not going to achieve my objective, I'm not going to reach my goal, I'm not going to maximize my moment, but I don't come to the plate by myself. I come with angelic forces. I come with the aid and assistance of God. And brothers and sisters, when you get to the giant of cancer, you get to the giant of depression, you get the giant of health issues, you get the giant of relationship that seem to be overwhelming. I want to tell you, you need to tell the devil, you need to tell the giant, you need to tell the struggle, you need to tell the obstacle, you need to tell the circumstance. I don't come alone. But David says, David says, I can face up in a battle because I have the weapons of assurance. I have confidence in God. You know why Paul says, Paul, Paul, who's on the house arrest, and how strange for Paul as he's on house arrest and guards going in and out. How strange and how unusual, how unorthodox for Paul to say, in the midst of all that, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. No weapon formed against me will be. No, notice Paul says that in Philippians while under house arrest. Isaiah quotes, no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper because he's talking about the prophetic message of Christ coming along. It's amazing in the midst of the doom and gloom, Isaiah says, no weapon formed against me. In the midst of being under house arrest, it's Paul who says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. And here is David. David says, I don't come alone. I come with the weapons of assurance. But David says, David, David not only has the weapon of assurance, but not only that, but David has a winning attitude. Notice what happens, if you will, verse 36, 46. He said, This day the Lord will deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee. Take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all earth may know that there is a God in Israel. He says, not only do I have the weapon of assurance, but I come to the plate because I am a winner. I am not a loser. I don't have a loser's limp. Every day is a victory for me. Every day I'm a winner, not because of my ingenuity, not because of my intellectuality, not because I'm so suave or sophisticated, but it's because God makes me a winner. And that's what I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that's out here listening and viewing online. You are not a loser. So you have to come to the game with your game face on. Prepared to do battle, to face your giants. And you come with the weapons of assurance in one hand, and you come with a winning attitude in another hand. David says, you will be mine. And that's what you got to say to the giants in your life, that I know that you came to come conquer me, consume me, and control me, but the devil is alive. Because I never show up to a game already planning my defeat. But I show up to every game knowing and believing that I can win. Because God makes me a winner. Not only do we see the weapons of assurance in a winning attitude. But notice here, if you will, as we continue to read, listen to verse uh, 48 and following. It says, he says, Verse 47, and all the assembly shall know that the Lord is not saved with the sword, nor with spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hand. 
The battle belongs to God. Verse 48, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh unto God to, to meet David. Then David hasted and ran forward. Notice he ran. He faces up. He doesn't run from the battle. He doesn't run from the challenge. He does not run from the obstacle. He faces his giant. And oftentimes, brothers and sisters, we put our head in our sand, in the sand, act as though it's not there, afraid and fearful. But God has not given you and I a spirit of fear. Matter of fact, the acronym says false fear is nothing more than false expectations appearing to be real. And that's the weapon of Satan. So what you have to do is you have to Breathe out fear and breathe in faith. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, we must face up in the battle because we got the weapons of assurance, because we have a winning attitude. But finally, when the, when the, when the giants show up, we must finish in the battle. Notice, if you will, verse 50 and following, it says, after this, after this giant came forth, notice what David does. David put his hand in his bag. Use what you got. A sling with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. I want you to catch that. Use what you got. The same thing that God told Moses when he was prepared to lead the children of Israel across the Red Sea. He said, what do you have in your hand? Even we think about Shamgar, and he had this, uh, he had this, he had this, his, this, this tool in his hand, and he was able to slew so many. And so God wants you to use what's in your hand, what's at your disposal. Must face up in the battle, but, but finally, we must finish in the battle. Notice what happened in verses 50 through 52. Notice what happened in the view. Verse 50, it says, So David prevailed on the Philistine with a sling, with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand to give God the glory. Verse 51, Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took the sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head. And Philistines saw their champion was dead. They fled. When you finish in the battle, God will elevate you, and then God will help you to eliminate the problem. And once you elevate yourself, and once God elevates you, he helps you to eliminate the problem, then it will empower the people that are around you to make them stronger, to make them wiser, to make them more attuned to the blessings of God, the breakthrough of God, the favor of God, and what God can do. What may seem impossible to others is not impossible with God. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, it's important for us to understand that when giants show up and they will, we have to filter in the battle. We have to fight in the battle. We have to face up in the battle, and then we have to finish in the battle. I know it's sometimes hard, it's sometimes challenging, overwhelming, you don't think that you can achieve it, but I want to leave you with the following words of Dr. Martin Luther King. King says it best, he says, courage is an inner resolution to go forward despite the obstacles. Notice what he says. Cowardice is the submissive surrender of circumstance. Courage breeds creativity with the innovation and the creativity to know that I can overcome this obstacle and that it's only going to be here for a season. Don't get stuck. Don't become paralyzed. Don't become overwhelmed by the giants. They do fall. When the giants show up, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in on today. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus in the part of your sin, you've never accepted him as your personal savior. I want to encourage you to pray this prayer, or perhaps you're one that's disconnected from the church, disconnected from God. 
and you become disillusioned with the spirituality or this thing we call church. I want you to pray with me, but I want you to do two things. And if you pray that prayer, if you pray this prayer, I want you to do two. I want you to do this. First, I want you to accept it. But secondly, I want you to drop me an email at machambers85 at gmail. That's M as in Michael, A as in Anthony, Chambers with an S, 85 at Gmail. And let me know that you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior or you have changed your life and you're moving in a new direction. So let us pray. God, our Father, we're just so thankful for this day. Master, most of all, we're thankful for those who are viewing online. Pray that their lives have been changed and have been blessed. And we're praying for that individual who says right now, that they need you to come into their heart, to consecrate their mind, their spirit, change them, consecrate their lives, and to make them better, but to make them more righteous and justify them. God, they admit, they believe, and confess that you are the Lord and Savior, and they have a desire for you to be the Lord and the Savior of their lives. Perhaps you're another person that's here today, oh God, that, that's, that's praying that may be saved, but says that, that they need to restart. So we're praying this prayer, God, I, I, I need to restart. I need to reassess. I need to rededicate. I want to be re-energized and be revitalized by your word and by your way and your will. Help me to rededicate. Help me to restart and to refresh my life in such a way that the floodgates of heaven is flowing in my mind and my spirit. I want to change. I want to move forward in a different direction. I want to start again. God, thank you for this day. and Thank you for these two sets of individuals that have prayed this prayer. This is your servant's prayer. Sing your darling son, Jesus Christ, then we do pray. Amen. Once again, if you have prayed either one of those prayers, I do want to encourage you to remember this, that God wants to bless your life. So I want to encourage you to let me know that you have made a decision to accept Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, or perhaps you want to rededicate your life. And I want you to send that information into me, to my email address, my personal email address, and so that I can correspond with you and walk with you. And that email address is, once again, is machambers, with an S, 85 at gmail.com. That's machambers85 at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you and corresponding and, and, and having a conversation with you about your walk in Christ. And as always, remember the following words, walk with the king and be blessed.